In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we enter into the last chapter of 1 Timothy. This has been a book that is really centered around the theme of the church as God's household. Should Christians be in a church? Absolutely, categorically, yes. In one sense, every Christian is in the church, is in the global church, whether they've made a decision or not. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive all of the benefits that he earned on the cross. When you trust in Jesus Christ and repent of your sins and say, I trust in Jesus, not myself. I trust in him for mercy so that I don't meet God in wrath. I trust that his death on the cross paid for my sins. All of those things. You get all of the benefits of Jesus' life and death and resurrection when you place your faith in Jesus. But you also become a part of his body. His all ages, invisible, all nations body. That is called the church, the the universal, the global, the invisible church, we call it. But, But every person who is involved in the universal church should also, must also, we see this all over the New Testament, join themselves to what God has called his household. That is his local churches on earth. Now, can you go to heaven if you're not in a church? Yes, of course, you don't go to heaven by going to church. But it's like saying, can I be in God's family and, and, and not live in the house? Can I neglect the family? Can I call none of my brothers and sisters? Can I not contribute to the, to the uh, uh, budget of the family? Can I do no chores? Can I still claim all the benefits of turning up to Christmas lunch, eating a feast, going home, not seeing anybody all year? Is that really a functional, mature, blessed, uh, responsible member of the family? The answer is absolutely no. If you're in God's family, you should be in a household. And that's where this language of household for the New Testament church has been brought up in the book of 1 Timothy so far. That we are God's family relationally. We are all sons of God. We are all little brothers of Jesus Christ and therefore we are giving, being given his inheritance. Men, women, old, young, we are all legally younger brothers of Jesus Christ. We are in his family But more than just family relationally, we are in a household in terms of responsibility. We have order and therefore we meet at organized times. We have order and therefore we have leadership in particular hierarchies. We have order and therefore we have delegated responsibilities. Elders do the teaching and shepherding. The deacons look after the material needs. Everybody finds a way to serve. We have obligations towards one another as God's household. And being in his household, the big idea has been this throughout the book. God is our father. Jesus Christ is our older brother who looks over the household. And they send their spirit to every member of God's household to fill us and to transform us in every part of our life. And that is what 1 Timothy has said. Even though this is really a book to the church, and it tells us about worship and order of worship and how to preach and things like that and how to put elders in place and deacons and that sort of thing, It has still also been all-encompassing for every Christian's entire life. That is because godliness, as the Holy Spirit comes into you, godliness will, will erupt, will bear fruit in every part of your life. When God seeks to transform sinners through the life of Christianity, He transforms every part of you and renovates every room. And that is where we come to this morning. Now we, we understand that the language of uh, the, one of the applications that Paul has as a redeemed, forgiven, filled by the Spirit, member of God's household in a church. Now Paul even gets to your work ethic and your relationship with your boss. That's where he gets this morning. I'll read the passage and we shall see what the good Lord would bless us with this morning. Uh, He says this through his apostle Paul, let all who are under a yoke of slavery regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not disrespect must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve them all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and the beloved. May God bless this word in our midst this morning. Paul writes to a church in Ephesus, uh, the church in Ephesus, which is in the Roman Empire. Now, when we uh, rewind ourselves back into history, we see that the Roman Empire was an economy built upon slavery. It was one of the bedrocks of their uh, 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 fiscal system and also their legal system as well as their workforce. 
Now, as we think slavery, don't think with 21st century Western uh, uh, lenses on. Think honestly, history is always more complex and always different and less simple than we wish to imagine. Slavery back then was in some measures perfectly fine, neutral, not even sinful. At other times, the ways that slavery was done was outright sinful and condemned by God's law. And in other measures, it was just unideal, though not technically breaking some of God's laws. Here's the reality. In the the Roman Empire, we could divide the slavery people, the slaves, all those who were slaves, into two categories. There was those who were unwillingly subjugated. These would be people who were taken as a a, a conquest in war. That's one thing. The New Testament speaks, the Old Testament speaks to that a bit, but we're not going to go into it. The other subjugated, conquered people would be those who were kidnapped, stolen, and taken and sold. The New Testament and the Old Testament condemn that as man-stealing, kidnapping, akin to murder. It is degrading, defiling, and destroying, um, uh, 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 on the aggressor's side, the image of God in the victim. And if you are found receiving, selling, or kidnapping a person, you were condemned to death according to God's law. That's the unwilling, subjugated side of the slaves. On the other side were those who had entered into some measure voluntarily. Let's not pretend they all just got up in the morning and dreamed about life as a slave, fulfilled their desires and ran to the nearest office and signed themselves up and branded themselves. Let's not think idealistically, but still, in some measure voluntarily have entered themselves or their family into a legal financial agreement called slavery or bond servitude. That's why some of your versions today might read, <coughs> all those who are under a yoke as bond servants. That language is uh, regarding slavery. Some translators choose to use the word bond servants because it, it, it sort of removes the stigma of that word. I don't care so much about stigma as truth, so let's just stick to that. As, as regards slavery in the Roman Empire, um, most slaves were released from their servitude by the age of 30. So that might even change how you thought of the whole horrible, terrible, disastrous slave trade back then. In many regards, it was actually not as bad as maybe Hollywood would make out or your latest Gladiator movie that maybe you've watched. Um, It was, in many regards, it was an abused system and it was a system with a lot of abuse within it, all of which is sin and should be condemned. But as a system in and of itself, as a fiscal contractual agreement where you obligate yourself to somebody and they take care of your financial obligations, that is selling yourself into slavery so that they give money, that itself, it really finds some of its uh, origins in the re- writings and teachings of the Old Testament. That is to say, don't think reactively as we are pro uh, 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 abolitionists in terms of modern slavery. We are pro abolitionist, yet in in history, slavery has not always looked the same. And and so really, their system was somewhat of a beneficial system if done rightly. This is why the apostles and even Jesus, they don't come out of the gate swinging and go, our whole economy, the entire empire is built upon the evil and the horror and the injustice of people owning other people by contract for financial gain. It's horrible. Let's destroy it. Let's upturn the entire empire. Let's turn Rome on its head. First of all, wouldn't work. 12 guys versus Roman Empire was going to be a loss every day of the week. Secondly, because whatever system you put in play, well, let's even think theoretically. Had the early Christians toppled and published widespread liberation and destroyed and broken every chain so that all of the slaves were free, what would that have accomplished? I tell you, absolutely nothing. Because now you would have up to 30% of the population. There's about 50 to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at the time of Paul's writing. If you did that, do you know what you would have? 50 to 60 million people out of jobs, out of the economy, homeless, houseless, familyless, unprotected on the streets. That's called Melbourne. No, I'm joking. That's, 
that's called chaos. That's where gangs arrive. That's how slavery gets involved because people find the desperate, the done, the out, and uh, the, 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 un, the unemployed. They bring them into their service and they start gangs and crime and anarchy and what, whatnot. So it really just ends up, and the history bears witness to this, it just flips it back on its head anyway and it sort of illegalizes and black markets slavery, but it happens anyway. Rather, what the apostles and Jesus teach is a heart-level change that contributes to the slow turning of the enormous ship that is slavery. So that within centuries, slavery would be done away with and outlawed within the Roman Empire, not because of a revolt or immediate reform or riots in the streets would, would be squashed by the Roman Empire, but rather by the slow dripping of change by people's hearts, uh, renewing, reforming their relationship to work itself. The anarchist, the uh, revolutionary, he wants to believe that if I, if I change my relationship with my uh, employer, if I become master, if I become free and break every chain, then we will have a better society, new people. Paul's instruction is not for you to radically change your relationship with your employer he believes we must, and he teaches, and he commands for us to radically change our relationship with the concept of work itself. Rethink work. Rethink who is ultimately your Lord. Rethink why you labor and all of these problems, at least Many of these problems will find themselves solved and anything else we rack up to the sovereignty of God as uh, ordained suffering in my life. So let's look at what he says here in verse 1. He says, first of all, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Paul is going to speak to the slave and instead of saying fight him, break the chain, revolt, get out, He's going to say, you only have so much, let's just acknowledge the sovereignty of God in your life, you have only so much in your sphere of influence. There are some Christians who are prime ministers, presidents, kings, queens, dictators, good on them, whatever it may be. And they may have a lot more in their sphere of influence, they can change laws, they can bring in bills, they can bring reforms, William Wilberforce, amen, hallelujah. 99.9% .9 of Christians are you and me, and we've got basically me, my family, and my area of employment. Okay, let's add my church. That's about the area of influence I have, right? I'm not changing any Australian laws next week by the signing of my quill pen. I think you can amen that too. The, uh, the, <laughs> the, error, the error for the Christian would then be to think, oh, so there's nothing we can do, and there's nothing influential we can do. What Paul wants us to realize is that that is what the world is made of. Little individuals, households, areas of, inf of employment, if you change enough of those, the whole wheel of the empire starts turning. So do not underestimate the power of self-renewal as you come and submit yourself to God's word, you, sub you, you, you cleanse your heart of impurities, you uh, uh, seek to serve Jesus Christ in your life, you look after your family, your own household, whether it's just you and a flatmate or just you alone or whether it's you and some kids and a spouse and whatever it may be, as you seek to bring God's influence and order into that and then you put that in, in your pocket, you take that to work as well, you work well as a Christian, bring some influence there. If that is all that God has given you in your sphere of influence, praise God, that is no small thing. Think about that, commit to that, let godliness affect your work. So while this is about slaves back then, we can think really largely any of us who have employments or contracts, we can think of ourselves similarly as slaves under bondage. Somebody wants to put their hand up and yell, amen, that's what it feels like. Uh, we may be more free in some measures, of course, than slaves back then. That is that we have the freedom to say, I quit, here's my resignation letter, I'm walking away. A slave did not have that freedom. If they did that, they would be found and killed. Okay, maybe your boss is like that. Most of them aren't. Uh, we have the freedom to walk away. But we don't actually have more freedom than those slaves according to the logic of the universe. In other words... They were forced often into this sort of situation of, I need to give them my son, my adult son, 
or I need to sell myself into slavery for a lump sum so that my family's debts can be covered and my family doesn't have to be killed, hunted, put in prison for their debts. I have to do that. And by contract of agreement, they will uh, either lump sum or they will send money to my family bit by bit. And I'm going to look after their family, do their cooking, do some agricultural needs, be an accountant. Whatever. Some slaves even owned other slaves, right? So the agreement there is really more binding, but similar, we could say, in our day for things like employment. That is, you have a contract of agreement. If you choose not to turn up on Monday and go to Fiji for a few months and expect to come back with money still coming into your account, you will be sorely disappointed. You are not free to live without making money of some kind, which comes through labor for somebody else. That's how it works. You will especially understand this reality if you are in or have been in the military. You are not free in the military. They keep close eye on you. You are given a number, not a name, not a flower, a badge. And if you want to say, thank you for the training, thank you for the food all these years, thank you for the housing, thank you for the income, I'm going to go on a trip for my, by myself overseas, they will say, no, you are still indentured, you are still required. We have extra years that you agreed to work for us to pay off what you've done. We have, you know, some, some athletes are like this. They literally sell themselves into certain contracts with certain bidders and certain companies so that they can earn for that. This is just how it works. So before we look and say, why would anybody sell themselves into slavery? Well, because life, because difficulty, because of the harshness of the world in which we live. That is why people would do it, just like you and I sign up for 7% mortgage rates, and you and I live... We work all week and we pay 25% on average in Australia. We pay 25% to the government just so they don't throw us in federal tax evasion prison. Does that sound like maybe, maybe the S word goes with that, the, the slavery word? Yeah, I don't know. I pay taxes, the Bible says. Interpret this how you will. But, but we, every, every country, every, every generation, every sort of empire works different. We find ourselves here. You're a Christian living in Australia, working for a boss, paying a lot to the government who didn't work 30% of your shift. But anyway, they get 30% of your money. Uh, then you have to give it to GST and you pay other things. You pay insurance. and We have less money than we want. We work for a boss we don't adore. 80% uh, of Australians, I think the statistic was, said they despise their jobs. Everyone of us are on somewhere on that spectrum. And we're asking the Apostle Paul, give us some message from heaven that since I am the child of God in his household, I get liberated from this stupid system that feels like or is literal slavery. And Paul says, honor your boss. Call him Lord Monday morning. Just see what happens. <laughs> At least sir. Morning sir. Oh, you just got a promotion. You just got a promotion right then. And you owe me 10% as a uh, finder's fee. <laughs> Call him Lord. You'll see what happens. But the application, therefore, would have come to the Ephesian church. About 30% of them would have been slaves. More of them would have been slave owners, maybe owning and employing people in the congregation. At, at, or could that be at this sermon? And then some of the others would have been former slaves, freedmen, and yet others would have been too poor to own slaves, but poor enough to maybe go into slavery soon for the sake of their family. The entire congregation would have been affected by this passage. And also in our day today, every, if I talk about work and employment, every person in the church is going to be affected by that because nobody is free from the ability to work or utilize somehow economic movements to pay money to live. So, Paul says, honor your boss. Before we get to your relationship to your employer, remember we said the anarchist wants to change their relationship with their employer. Give me a better boss and I'll be a better worker. That's not how it works. Christians think, if I just had a great Christian boss, I would just be a better worker. No. Start with your relationship with work it's, now, this applies to people who aren't in the workplace but are under, let's just use Paul's language, the bond of slavery at home to their husbands. No, I'm joking. You're not going to be, you're not going to feel like that. But maybe you're not in the workplace, but you work at home. You look after kids. You teach them at home. You have all sorts of chores. You also have work, labor to do to contribute to the family. So every, every person needs to rethink our relationship to work, and we'll start here with a theology of work. A theology of work. What is your, if I got you to write a hundred words, quick, quick write up, what is your theology of work, labor, and economy? Why do you do it? What's your motivation? Why does God have you? Why do we have to do it? Write up, what would you think? Some people think this way, if they haven't thought much about it before. They just sort of, well, 
you know, I have hobbies, I have pleasures, I have hopes and dreams, I have recreational activities that I would love to do. I can't do them for free and with no money, so I have to go to work. I don't have a self-sufficient passive income, so I go to somebody else, they give me money, I get home, and one day a week, maybe two if I skip out on church, uh, maybe two out, uh, days a week, maybe a few hours in some of the afternoons, I get to do some of those fun things, and the rest of the time I'm a slave, but hopefully someday I'll get to retire, by the way the economy's gone, when I'm 95, I'll get to retire on $4,000 a year, and then I'll just kick back and enjoy the amazing... Uh, Communist Australia, we now enjoy. <laughs> Just joking. So, so how do you think? Is that how you think about work? Oh, I got to work because I want to have fun and it's a necessary evil. In heaven, we'll just have fun all the time with no work. This is wrong. Here's how we should think about work. It is placed and finds its origin in the nature and person of God. God is a worker and a creator. And I, made in his image, am called to work and create like him. That's why you work. God's work and creation serves those in this world, meeting their needs and supplying them. And I, by my work and creation, serve those in the world by meeting their needs and contributing. By God's work and creation, he images and shares that perfect triune community in the Godhead. By my work and creation, I image that relationship and build community in the world based on God's love. By God's work and his creation, he shows me that this whole world is embedded with his glory. And by my hard work and creation, I can tap into that glory, discover and invent and produce marvelous things. By God's work and creation, he displays and earns himself glory. And by my hard work and my creation, I image him in these ways and am therefore able to glorify him as well. That's why we work. Because we're made in the image of a working God. Now, we might think, of course, this side of the fall, sin came in and work and the nine to five week and bosses were created. Wrong. Everything we just said was true in the garden before the fall came. Hierarchy, bosses, lordship, uh, uh, work, all of that was commanded to, to Adam before the fall even came. So it is necessary to ask the question, you know, this is such a big blessing. I'm supposed to wake up every Monday morning, 5.45, alarm goes off. It's like angels singing in my ear and little songbirds carry me into my dirty work boots and my socks that I forgot to wash. And I sit on the M1 traffic for 40 blessed minutes and I travel 20 meters into the depths of hell. And here I am, the most blessed. This is work, is it? Why is it so difficult? Why is it so hard? Why is it so, so sweaty, so laborious, so difficult and inefficient? Because of the fall into sin and the curse of God upon us. Why is work wrought with disharmony, cheating, and infighting between people? Because of the fall and the curse of God upon us. Why is it so consuming of so much of our life with so little time for downtime? Because of the fall and the curse. Why is it so a, a, a culpable for abuse? Why is it so open for tyranny and enslavement and manipulation and theft because of the fall and God's curse? Why have humans never arrived at a utopia and don't believe the AI, robotic, false prophets? Don't believe that we will ever arrive at a utopia where human beings will not have to break a sweat to live. Why? Because it is the curse of God upon our race that by the sweat of our brow we will eat the bread. It is because of the permanent fall and the curse of God upon our race. So we need to think properly about work. It is cursed, let's be real. But it is a blessed thing that has been cursed. It is redeemable for God's glory. And for Christians with a renewed mind, with maturity, who aren't self-centered, even slaves, Paul expects, will be able to do their work in a God-glorifying way with joy. This is a remarkable thing. So he says, first of all, that they may consider or regard, treat their master with all due honor. Reg notice that he doesn't say, assess your boss, take a timesheet on him, you know, t 
time him, see how much breaks he takes in the world, see how he treats you in the other, and then decide on sort of a, a, a matrix scale, decide how much honor he's worth on the bell curve. He in fact says, Be, I don't even need to know what master you have, what kind of boss you have, he, she may be trash. Yeah. They, she, he may have gotten the job from some horrible diversity hire and have no clue what they, she, z are doing in this job. They may be the the, the formerly unemployed nephew of your present CEO. That's the only reason they got the job. I'm not asking. Paul says, whoever they are, decide now you are going to treat them, whatever their name is, with all honor. Treat them as if they are worthy of all honor because whether you like it or not, God is sovereign over who gets what jobs. And if they're your boss, they're your boss by God's decree and design. There's something you got to learn. There's something you got to submit to. There's some uh, humility before God that he wants to train you. There's some readiness for future productivity that he needs to train into you right now. Who knows, but God is sovereign. So treat them with authority, with Honor with a submission in that sense, as is due your job, uh, uh, not because of their own merit, but because of God's uh, commandment. So in other words, Christians should not be known, right? The Christians in the office should not be known. Sometimes this is worse in Christian employment settings. Christians should not be known as the people who don't do their work because they're lazy, sitting around, the Holy Spirit will get it all done, Jesus is coming back soon anyway, don't work hard. Not a Christian attribute. Christians should not be those who are dishonest with their work, who are lying, cutting corners, and uh, fudging some of the numbers. Not what Christians should do. Christians should not be those who are gossiping in the workplace, starting up catty uh, infighting and politics and cliques. We should have nothing to do with that. Christians should not be those who are um, uh, uh, calling in sick uh, for false reasons. You know, you've got to get to the prayer meeting, and so I'll call in sick. Oh, I'm sorry, can't come in today. I'm really sick. Hang up. Praise Jesus. I will come worship you. Not honoring to God. Jesus demands that you honor him by honoring your earthly lords, your earthly masters, your earthly employers, since this work is his idea, employment is his design, and your boss is his intentional will. So sometimes you guys have maybe have had this experience. You find out that somebody's a Christian, as an empl- like you're an employer, and you find out somebody's a Christian, and you've got high hopes, this is great. They go to a church. I know, you know, his great uncle, this is going to be a good guy. And he does nothing but sit down and argue about infralapsarian, supralapsarian, was John Edwards a di- trichotomist or a dichotomist all day, and he wastes your time. And you try and talk to him about it, and like, oh, dude, come on, what would Jesus do? Let's slow down, you know. Uh, uh, this is more important. What, what do you love, work and money more than God? I feel sorry for you, right? Sometimes you you find out people are Christians uh, 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 and it's a bad thing. It's a detriment to God's honor. Other times you're working in the work, workforce and, you know, before long that you find out they're a Christian, you sort of strike a chord and you get a conversation. You find out they're a Christian. You try to evangelize them. They tell you, I love those conversations. I love, I hate it when, it only happened a couple of times. This is a competition I set for myself. I encourage this on all employees. I set a goal. No one would find out I'm a Christian by trying to evangelize me. I hate it. It happened once. Some woman tried to talk to me about whether, whether or not I, you know, what do I think about the afterlife? I said, oh, I'm a Christian. She goes, oh, I was trying to invite you to church. I'm like, you beat me. You beat me. So I decided from then on, no one would find out I'm a Christian by evangelizing me. I would find out they're a Christian by evangelizing them. And I only got beaten one more time, but I'll get them. So uh, uh, basically, uh, sometimes you've had this, com- this realization, though, in the workforce. You find out they're a Christian, you go, this makes sense. You're kind, you're generous, you're pleasant, you, you arrive on time, you're helpful. When I'm running behind, you sort of chip in and, and help out. You're, you're, you're a blessing to be around and a help to work with. And you, you go a little bit beyond and you don't scab off and run off before, before quitting time. And then you find out they're a Christian, you go, that makes a lot of sense. That's what we're aiming for. It is remarkably easy to stand out in this day and age. It is remarkable, young Christians, hear me, it is enormously easy to stand out for your work ethic in this day and age where people think, the old joke goes, that manual labor is an old Mexican president. (laughs) Cue hilarious laughter. Right, where people, basically, if you turn up on time, you're an angel. 
Like you are Michael the archangel just come down from heaven. Why are you here before 20 minutes into the shift? You're here, you're helping other people out. Uh, you're going, even, even just meeting your job requirements, like, like just doing the things you're required to do without leaving stuff behind. Get out of your mindset this, this phrase that says, that's not my job. If it's in the workforce, that's part of my job because we're a team. Just work hard and then don't leave before the bell goes. I'm telling you, you will be in the top 1% in the entire workforce. You will get uh, uh, promotions, you will get uh, pay rises, you will, get, you will be blessed and encouraged and honoured and thanked by your employer by just meeting the bare minimum often. Now, don't meet the bare minimum. Strive for excellence as Jesus would have you. But it's a tremendous way to see uh, the Lord bless your work. So maybe in Ephesus, this is where we come back to, honour your, your master. I wonder if in Ephesus, because remember they were, they were influenced by some misconstrued Old Testament paradigms. I wonder if in Ephesus there were some Christians enslaved to non-Christians, which is the context here in verse 1, and they were thinking with Israelite, Babylonian, Greek, Roman mentality. And they were thinking, ah, this is God's curse. They are God's enemy. They are subjugating me. They are requiring me to work. Therefore, everything I do, Every labor I do, every pot I fill, every cup that I pour, everything I do, every pig that I tend, every, every meal that I cook, it's all for Satan. My work is unholy. My work is in enmity against God because of my boss. Ah, God will smile if I sabotage my boss, if I steal from my boss, because it's me and Jesus against my boss. I wonder if this false dichotomy of sacred work and secular work or, or unholy work and, and holy work had gotten into the mind of the Ephesians. I wonder if it's gotten into your mind at all. Martin Luther said it best in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, one of the magisterial reformers, when the Catholics really believed the high flute and pollutant guys who worked for the church and wore dresses and swung around candles, they were holy you losers had to go and work basically for Satan out in the world so that you could give money to the priests, the prelates, and the clergy. They would speak of the sacred jobs and the secular unholy jobs. Martin Luther came to the scene and said, we read the New Testament and Paul honors the housewife, the slave, the street sweeper, and everything else up to a king. Which means that it's not so much a matter of holy work and unholy work. It's a matter of holy worker and unholy worker, a, sa a sacred workman and a secular workman. So if you belong to Jesus, in other words, he died for your sins at the cross, he paid for your forgiveness and has earned you away into heaven, and he has, always, he has also made you a holy person. So that as long as the tasks and the actions and the decisions that you're doing and making are not in themselves evil, it doesn't matter if you're serving ice creams, sweeping a street, cleaning toilets, uh, 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 you're a bouncer at some very strange uh, uh, company, and uh, uh, you know whatever it may be, you work for a very questionable employer, your work is ultimately being done for Jesus. You're a sacred worker. This is a mindset that we must imbibe and understand, and in doing so, give honor and work hard for your master, for your employer. The grand motivation that Paul gives us here is so that God and the teaching, so that the name of God, the reputation of God, and the teaching that we imbibe, that we embody, that we teach as a church is not reviled. It's not mocked. It's not blasphemed, right? People find out you're a Christian. You go, oh, Jesus, what? I, I don't believe it's true. You're helping me believe that. But there's something in the water that when somebody calls themselves a Christian, when they join some church somewhere, they get lazy, they get hyper-spiritual, they get back chatty, they get entitled, and they keep on telling me I'm unelect, whatever that means. Right? They go, oh, these, these, and, and the teaching. Because what happens is people, people see your acts and then learn what you think. They go, oh, you're, you're under the teaching of, was it Hope Church? I might look them up. Because they produce all of these people that are lazy, entitled, rude, uh, don't believe in employment, don't believe in tax, because the pastor said something about that. Uh, uh, they're all revoltists, they're anarchists, they're libertarians, they don't love government. Oh, this is a problem, right? What we want to see is people, call, when they see Hope Reformed Baptist Church on a CV or a resume, they dial up and go, look, I've already employed some of your people. I've heard they're good. They're, they're beyond their years in productivity and maturity and responsibility and oversight. They're above and beyond. Can we please employ you? I, I've had the honor of sometimes, I, I, 
people call me up because some of you have applied for their job. And I'm pretty honest. I say, you know, they, they work hard. They serve on this. And how much do you pay them for that? I'm like, that's not a job. This is, they're just generous. They turn up on a Sunday. They do these things. They help these people. Here's what I've heard. Here's what I've seen. Here's what I've done. You go, my goodness. And, and this, is just, this is just common at your church? I'm like, yeah, you wouldn't believe it. You should come. You should come. You should come. <laughs> But, but that's, that's what Christians should be known for, and praise God. Uh, it, it's true that I see this in people's, uh, uh, either I get uh, 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 testimonies from, uh, from uh, employers or just see it right. This should be the case. People, the teaching that you receive from the Bible must be, they may not believe in your God, but they cannot deny the fruit of it in your life. Go, wow, I've, I can't even, some of you sitting right here in recent, uh, you know, uh, 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 in the last 12 months have been converted or thinking seriously about Christianity or been baptized, and one of the first things that really tipped you off was, I have a, a certain set of values and beliefs, and they're fairly traditional and old-fashioned, and I come here and I see men being men, women being women, people working hard, being generous, standing up for the family. This is, this is, this is a, 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 a synchronizing. This is tapping into something very deep for me. It's good for the reputation of God, the name of God, and the teaching that we have as a church when Christians back up their confession with hard, hard work. The fact that we are called to labor ultimately for the glory of God removes every excuse that arises from our situation. But you don't know my boss. Don't need to. This is Paul the Apostle. But you don't know my employment situation. I don't need to. God does. He calls you to labor. John Newton spoke to this reality. He said, if two angels were to receive at the same moment a commission from God, one to go down and rule earth's grandest empire and the other to go and sweep the streets of its meanest village, it would be a matter of entire indifference to each which service fell to his lot. The post of ruler for one, or the post of scavenger for the other. For the joy of the angels lies only in obedience to God's will. And with equal joy, they would lift a poor Lazarus in his rags up to Abraham's bosom, or be a chariot of fire to carry an Elijah home. This is the fact for the Christian. You may have a horrible job that I would never volunteer for. Some others may have a job that makes others quite jealous and an income that is impressive. But regardless of your station in life, it has been ordained by God, your boss ordained by God. And he, if, if, if my call, if, if a pastor's example, if an elder's exhortation, if they all fall flat and can't get you out of bed on a Monday morning, think of this. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who is in all glory and yet became a slave of all. The Lord of glory who lived as an employee who built things with wood, who was a carpenter for the majority of his life on earth. It's that Jesus who set an example, died for your sins, rose again, is seated back in glory with a kingdom beneath him. He now calls you, I send you to your work to labor for my glory. Then he makes a necessary qualification or a, I guess, an expansion, a necessary clarification. Here's what he says in verse 2. Now, those who have believing masters, how good is that? Having a Christian boss, Christian workplace, you open up with the Lord's Prayer, you do some catechism at morning tea, you sing, you sing a worship song or two on Friday mornings. It's tremendous. This is good. You have Christian radio going on. This is a good place. They don't make you wear rainbow lanyards. This is a good workplace. It's great. This is fun. He says, now, those who have believing masters, the ante is upped. It's even more severe and intense and demanding that you bring your best work. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. They must, rather, they must serve all the better. Now, Chris, we, we sort of read that and go, why would I disrespect my boss even more because he's a, he's a brother. That doesn't make sense. I would respect him all the more. Here's the problem. Paul knows how we think and how we act. Paul knows that a Christian is very likely to hear that they've got a Christian master, either as a slave master or as an employer, and instead of genuine respect, they will give sentiment. Now, sentiment can go out the window. It's worth nothing except in courts and palaces. Etiquette is very important. In real life, sentiment is worth nothing. Here's what Christians do. 
in, they used to work hard because they were afraid of their boss. They didn't know whether they were going to come in drunk and get beat up one day or whatever. They, they worked real hard for them. Then they found out they're a Christian. And they walked into their master's house, jumped on his easy boy, cranked up his chair, put on the sports and said, how good's Jesus? Isn't it just, now we're, we're bros. I'm not going to call you sir anymore. How about, how about, how about bud? Is that all right? Uh, because we're equals, remember, in the, in the household of God. We're brothers, right? You're not my boss, you're my brother. Uh, when, when I turn up late to work, I was reading the Bible. You understand? I was, I was just, I was reading scripture. And I know I'm back late from my break, but I was, I was praying, brother. I was praying for you, actually, that you would be merciful and kind. And just f- show the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And not take any, um, any, 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 you know, reactions against people who do you wrong. And, you know, and when, you, when they finally get pulled into their office and sat down because their productivity has dropped, they're not working hard, and they're putting a drag on the rest of the team, they just sort of teary eye. And you know, what, what would Jesus do? <laughs> would Jesus make my wife a, 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 a starve with no income coming home? Really? Is that, is that what you think? Jesus would do. Why don't you pray about it? I'll come back and see you tomorrow. Christians are likely to give lots of sentiment. You're a brother. I love you. We're going to heaven together. In replacement for actual full-bodied respect, which says, I will do what you say. That's what respect is in employment. You have purchased my hours. As long as your request, this is the, the, you know, the benefit of being in the 21st century, we have an actual contract of obligations. You can't ask me to do just anything. But as long as your requests are in there, I'm not going to huff puff and say, what about my freedom of will? And I really wanted to go on TikTok now. I'm going to say, your will is my command. That's literally my job. I'm an employee. If I don't like that, I should start my own business. And uh, uh, may God bless you as you do so, maybe. So, uh, we must show no less respect just because they are a Christian. We must increase our effort, our work ethic, our uh, labor, and our energy in order to, and he gives us a reason here, you must serve all the better. So what, we don't give our full for the non-Christians? No, you give your full, plus some if they're a Christian. You don't give them less if they're not a Christian, they get 90%. You give them more if they're a Christian. Right? You turn up earlier, you work harder, you benefit them even more because the money you make them, the profit you make them, the productivity you, you, you increase for them, the human resources you bring in, the benefits you reap, the, 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 the training you impart to the other people, it's all going into the pockets and the wallets and the bank accounts of a man who loves Jesus and has been placed in this job in order to be generous to the kingdom. He's going to go home, Lord willing, tithe this to his church. He's going to use it for kingdom ventures. He is in God's place in order to be a receptor of more money than you, if he's your employer, in order to benefit the kingdom. And that should be a joy to a Christian. This is what, you know, a lot of Christians will get like a, um, let's use a plumber, for example. Plumber comes over to your place and he's doing work and you realize that, I don't know, he has a fish tattoo somewhere on his back uh, or, or something. Or you, or you see, you know, a, a bumper sticker with a cross on it on his, on his rundown truck. And here's what most Christians do. Oh, oh, you know, I'm so blessed you're here today. Oh, and then he picks up on the word blessed and he says, amen. Oh, we're Christian. We're speaking Christianese. Uh, and, you know, and you go, I'm a Christian. Oh, you're a Christian. This is so great. We're great. How about a bit of a discount, brother? You know, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Here's what Jesus would do. Jesus would have us, instead of saying, you're a brother, give it to me cheaper, Christian will say, you're a brother, can I give 10% more? Can I, can I give extra to your company, which is employing Christians, furthering the kingdom, so that you can, you can tithe it all if you want, but I want to give you extra. The plumber doesn't go, you're a Christian, I'll let you finish up all these tap work. You're okay with that, right, brother? What would Jesus do? Christian plumber's going to go, you're a Christian? Hey, on my way out, is there any taps that need fixing, any leaking things, any light? I'll give lights a go as well, because uh, I love you so much. <laughs> hint, hint, okay? So... Christians look out for each other, aid each other, work well together for the sake of the kingdom, uh, ultimately. And this is, this is, uh, obviously, it's just rich with application. Every single one of us can go home, either as an employer, a CEO, an entrepreneur, an employee, a student, part-time, full-time. We're all going to have somewhere where we need to repent to the Lord and say, Lord, make me more honest, harder working, more honorable. Also, Lord, though, I'm praying that sort of beyond the basic applications of this text, we might see into the future a little bit. I might think with a little bit of vision. 
Imagine not just your career and your life, if you're young maybe, you've got 50 years ahead of you in laboring and working before your body starts shutting down and you can't anymore. The Lord is calling you to to labor now and think what it might be if you are zealous, if you outshine your peers, if you are honoring to authority, God will bring that honor back into you. That's what he says. If you're faithful in the little, he will make you faithful over much. That's what you should pray for. You can sort of see, but not only in your individual career and life and family and income. Think also of us as a, as a broader church. We're not responsible for other churches, but this one we are. As a household, teeming, brimming with with, with soldiers and hardworking, often in the church's volunteers, others are on staff. We have so many people in our church that are hard workers. We just have a, a cohort of up-and-coming hard laborers. Imagine what, by God's grace, might happen for the Great Commission in and through us if, those are, if this continues to happen, train up others and utilizing our best efforts for the kingdom and making money for ourselves and the kingdom. What might, what might be possible? This, this expands the church's horizons exponentially because the Great Commission has infinite possibilities by God's grace. If we do this, we become a hard-working, generous church. By God's grace, the swelling cohort of foot soldiers that we have right now will become an army of well-trained, disciplined business owners, entrepreneurs, employers, investors, all of them supporting their families and funding the mission and glorifying God in their workplace. All, all that to, aside from ministers, pastors, missionaries, elders, and the like. All of this, by God's grace, starts right now. And maybe you're sweeping, maybe you're a burger flipper, maybe you drive an Uber, or maybe you have multiple hundred people underneath you. I don't know, but it starts now. This fruitfulness for the Great Commission to God's glory. If you're not a Christian, though, that is that if you have not been transformed by his grace, you're not actually technically in the household of God. Here is what is most essential for you. As you think about work, let's start here. The problem, as you think about work, you probably fall into two categories. You're either a bit of a winner and you make money and you have the dreams and you have the house and you have the trophy family maybe. You're living your life, you're reaching your goals, you're having wins. You are consumeristically worshipping yourself, setting up yourself as the Lord of all that deserves all pleasure and honor and glory, and it's selfish, and it's, it's what we call worldly because you're living for this world. Banking everything you got on maximizing pleasures in this world, and your tragedy, though I understand the drive because God has made us to be workers, creators, uh, uh, dominion takers, and, and I see that. Your problem is that upon your death, your entire empire will turn to dust. Your clothes will disappear. Your excuses will melt and you will stand before God as you came into the world, naked to give account to him alone for all of your actions, everything you did, how you got your money, how you spent your money, who you cheated, who you lied to, whether you paid the right and correct amount of taxes and wages. And you give an account for everything. If you have any sin in your life, and you will have plenty of sin on that record, your riches cannot meet you at the bar and argue a case for you. Your money, your wealth, your boat, none of that can come into the courtroom to try and excuse you a little bit. Riches will benefit nothing on the day of God's judgment. and You will enter into eternal fire. Maybe you're in a second category and that doesn't relate to you because you're, you feel like you're losing. You go, you work for the man, you give the man half your money, you go home to your flatmates and there's 12 of you living in a two-bedroom house and you're struggling to get by on two-minute noodles and it's just a daily grind. Your family, you know, you weren't born into privilege or whatever they might say these days. You're starving, you're hating your life, you're grinding away, you're not really feeling like you're making it in life and you're grinding your teeth for no gain. And to this scripture would say, I think C.S. Lewis summarized it the best, if you feel that you are made for something beyond this world, or, or if you have a sense and a feeling that nothing in this world can satisfy you, it is a good proof that you were made for something beyond this world. And this is, the, this is the reality of many humans, is that we grind, we drive, we labor, we toil, we drive, we die. Your whole life feels purposeless. The actual good news of Jesus is that your life is not purposeless, your soul is not worthless. You are a human being that will give account to Jesus, but your biggest problem is not your poverty. Your biggest problem is your sin. And just like the rich man, you will give an account for your sins. You will give an account for your acts. 
and how much money you had in your account and how much of a victim you were won't mitigate God's justice and you'll enter into hell the same. The gospel is the same for both of you. Repent of your sin. Both of them are worldliness and greed. One's just winning, one's losing. Whoever you are, however you're relating to the world, whichever picture that uh, sort of fulfills you there or, or paints you there, the answer is to repent of your sins. Turn away from trying to find satisfaction in this world through work and money. Turn to Jesus. Say, I'm sorry for my sins. I see that on the cross you died for sinners like me to pay for the sins of sinners like me. I want to be forgiven. I can't do it myself. Take me to heaven, Lord Jesus. Please do that. In this moment, call upon Jesus and you will be forgiven. You will be saved. And your whole life is transformed as Jesus transforms you and puts you to work for his kingdom. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word regarding this most basic part of our life, labor, work. Every one of us will have to do this. Every one of us will experience the, uh, the burn of working, the pain of working, the sweat of working, the uh, the, 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 the feeling, feelings of, of, um, of lack of productivity, of wasted time, of futility in work. Others, others will see the kinds of glory and power and wealth that we can amass. And, Lord God, both of us, all of us, need to be renewed by your word, need to be shaped into submission to the word of God. We need to recognize we are not Lord. We are under the curse of the Lord in this world. We are not God. We are, we are fallen from God. Work is cursed and our labor and our souls are sinful. Father God, I, I pray that you would re redeem, save, regenerate, give faith to those who are in the room right now, who have believed up until now that their identity, their, their whole selves, their life, their, 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 their soul could be built up by how hard they work and how much they make. Lord God, please rebuke that and give them faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can save them from hell. We pray also, Lord God, for every single Christian who is in this household, that we would relate to each other as a household, that we would labor outside, that we would scatter for mission and work. We would come back and be built up, encouraging one another and giving towards your most important mission, the Great Commission. We thank you, Lord God, for your gospel, which saves us, your word, which continues to inspire and to send and exhort us. We thank you for today and glorify you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.